And welcome to Modern Life is Good. If my name is Dave Gorman, and later on, I'm going to be telling you all about the time I sat next to Jennifer Aniston on a roller coaster. <laughs> but I want to start with something a bit less exotic. I want to start with something a bit closer to home, something that I saw recently. I was shopping the other day when I saw this. Which is <laughs> just a bit disturbing, isn't it? I mean, I was in mother care, and that just seems... <laughs> like I wasn't in mother care. That was just a very lazy joke. Route one, pretend it was a highly inappropriate place. And I'm not sure why I bothered, because the reality is that it was in a highly inappropriate place. It was in a butcher's. I don't know about you, but I think that's more inappropriate. <laughs> yeah, you can have a bull in a butcher's, that's fine. You can have a cleaver in a butcher's, that's fine. But you put a bull and a cleaver together in a butcher's, <laughs> that's a recipe for disaster. What is the message that that is trying to convey? Even though it makes no sense for a bull to be happy in a butcher's shop, I would understand the marketing message if it was a bull happily sacrificing itself for your Sunday lunch. But that isn't a happy-to-be-eaten bovine facial expression, is it? That is an expression that says, you're home early. <laughs> that is an expression that says, what do you mean what's happened to the real butcher? <laughs> I am the real butcher, don't look down there, I'll use it! <laughs> Nothing about this picture makes sense. Bulls don't have opposable thumbs. He can't pick up a cleaver, he can't tie an apron. Someone's had to tie that on him. <laughs> Approaching a bull with a red and white apron? That is a red and white rag to a bull, that is. <laughs> no wonder the guy's annoyed. We're used to the idea, I think, that animals can be used to sell us stuff, especially food. And if it's in a butcher's shop, I think it really has to be one of the animals that the butcher sells. In truth, even a lamb would be considered weird, I think. It's really got to be a pig or a cow in a butcher's. Nothing else makes sense. If you try to use a friendly animal that the butcher doesn't sell, that just gets even weirder, doesn't it? All of a sudden, <laughs> just wrong. And that's because there are rules when it comes to using animals to sell food to humans. And I don't mean legal rules, I mean social rules. Rules that you might not know exist, that nobody has ever taught you, but that you still understand. I will prove that to you with a quiz that I like to call What's in the Packet, then? <laughs> OK, now, I don't need the specifics, no brands, just what kind of food stuff is being sold. Item number one, ladies and gentlemen, what do you think is in the packet? Sausages. Sausages, bacon, bacon sausages and bacon. Basically, a pork product, yeah? And we know that, don't we, because it's got a pig on it. The happy pig is giving away the fact that that contains, in this instance, bacon. It's a very simple rule, isn't it? The animal on the packet is what's in the packet. So, what do we think is in that packet? Fish. fish. Of course it is. It's fish. The same rule applies. So we've established a pattern. The picture of an animal on the packet is what is inside the packet. So, what is this? <laughs> what do we think that is, ladies and gentlemen? Dog food, of course it is, and you know that. You understand that it's not dog meat because you know the rules. And you instinctively know that now that it's a dog, the rule is different. The rule for a dog is what's on the packet is what's waiting impatiently for you to open the packet because he's been a very good boy. <laughs> what's on the packet is the intended recipient of what's in the packet. So, that was dog food. This is... Cat food. And this is... No, that's actually cat food made out of rabbit. Um, <laughs> it's tricky, this, isn't it? With rabbit, a rabbit can be food and also eats food. They straddle two different categories. If, you, if that's uh, is, uh, rabbit food, that's one made out of rabbit, that one is for rabbit. If you didn't speak English, you would really struggle to know which one was which <laughs> just from looking at the packaging, wouldn't you? It's especially confusing to me because it looks like the vital, happy, lively rabbit is the one that's going to be eaten. <laughs> And the one that appears to have had its eyes pecked out <laughs> is the one that's going to eat some food. <laughs> We've established at this stage two categories. The animal on the packet can be what's inside the packet, or it can be the intended consumer of what is inside the packet. But there is another category. What is that? Milk. Milk. Of course it is. Obviously, it's not a pint of beef, is it? <laughs> <laughs> this is rule number three. Certain animals can be on the packet if they produced what is inside the packet. This is true for cows, as we know. It's also true for bees. And, of course, it works for Lloyd Grossmen as well. <laughs> <laughs> 
Now, I know that we all know the rules, but I'm gonna give... I'm gonna give you, sir, a chance to prove that you have understood the rules. I'm gonna give you a little Venn diagram to fill in, OK? Now, there are three categories here. Category number one, in the packet. Category number two, it is the intended consumer of what's in the packet. And category number three, is it made the food, OK? You're understanding so far? I'll tell you what, I'll, yep. give you, I'll give you a couple of easy ones just to start you off. We all know where pigs, cats and dogs go because they are single category animals. So they're very easy to place. But not all animals are single category. Some are more complicated than that. Oh, let's start you off with rabbits. Just by number, sir, which category, how many categories do you think rabbits belong in? Probably two. Two and three. Two and three. You think they made the food? If you think they... <laughs> yes! If you think they made the food, sir... <laughs> If you think they made the food, you have been eating the wrong raisins. <laughs> You're not wrong. So it's not three. No. But they can be in the packet. Yes. Because you can eat rabbit. And they can have food provided for yes. them. They can be in the any consumers. I'm, I'm one... good at this game. We're there. We're one and two. You're understanding it. OK, let's move on. Cows. Where do cows belong, sir? Cows can be in the packet. Yeah. And they can be three. So one and three, you're saying a lot of people would say one and three, but you're mistaking the fact that cows don't make milk for us. We actually steal their milk. <laughs> true. Cows are the intended consumers yeah, of milk true. as well, yes. so they are actually, rarely, they are in all three categories. Yes. One of the few beasts to get there in the middle of there. Let's have a look at bees. OK. Where do bees belong? Now, you've never had a packet of bees, no, I know that definitely much. definitely not. Right. <laughs> Let's discount category one immediately. Uh, three. Three. They are also the intended consumers of honey. They make the honey for themselves. Again, we steal bees' honey from them, so they go in two and three. Now, chickens. That's an easy one. Come on. Well, chickens, chickens. are in the packet. They're definitely in the packet. They don't eat themselves. They don't eat themselves. <laughs> uh, you could say eggs. Yeah, uh, eggs. They make so eggs, don't they? So, one and yeah. three. One and three, exactly. You're understanding this. Fish. Well, fish are in the packet. Yeah. They don't eat themselves. Yeah. The, 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 the all you're proving, though, sir, is you're not a caviar eater, cos they also... <laughs> <don't play. laughs> there's eggs, there's fish eggs, they go in one and three. This is a set of rules that each of us is completely familiar with, even though we've never given it any thought whatsoever. Incidentally, that there is my favourite part of the diagram. That is the part of the diagram that scientists refer to as the land of milk and honey. Um, <laughs> for obvious reasons. There is actually there is another animal I should have put on there. Let's I'll, I'll give you a little uh, another little chance. A lion. lion. Okay, a lion. Where do, oh, no, I'll tell you what. I'll make it easier. I'll make it more granular for you. Let's make it a dead lion. <laughs> what, what would a dead lion be on the packet? I'll tell you what. I'll make it even easier. Let's say a rotting <laughs> dead. Like, let's say a rotting dead lion carcass. Right. On a food product. Very where specific. would where would that go? A rotting dead lion carcass. Um, it is very specific. Syrup from over there. Absolutely, we have a wise one. I'm going to invent a fourth category, sir. We have a whole new category, and that is the golden syrup category. <laughs> yeah. A rotting dead lion goat. If you don't believe me, there is a tin of Lyle's golden <laughs> syrup. <laughs> and that is genuinely... I'm not making that up. That is genuinely a rotting dead lion carcass. It is. And that isn't a, a sleeping lion, and those aren't some flies on the African savanna. Those are bees, perhaps suggesting that there's honey in the tin. But there's not honey in the tin, it's sugar. And that is a dead lion, suggesting that... I have no idea what that is. <laughs> Nor does anyone else. The reason I know that that is a rotting dead lion carcass is because I recognise the Bible quote that accompanies it. Out of the strong came forth sweetness. It's what's known as Samson's Riddle. It's from the Book of Judges, chapter 14. Now, I'm not a religious man myself, but I can appreciate that the Bible is full of moral messages and lessons for the world, and I have no problem with someone trying to spread the word. That's OK by me. And I imagine that's what's going on here. Mr Lyle must have been thinking, I like the message of Samson's Riddle. I'll put that on the tin. <laughs> You know, if you don't know the story, I'll just explain it very briefly. Samson, he was one of the Nazarites, yeah? Strong fella, good hair. You know about him. One day, Samson, he's on his way to propose to a girl that he fancies. Now, she's not a Nazarite, she's a Philistine, so not everyone was very happy about it, but he knows his own mind, does Samson. <laughs> anyway, he's on his way to propose when he kills a lion, the way you do. She says yes when he proposes, so a little while later, he goes back to get her and he stops off on his way to look at the lion carcass and he sees that some bees have made a hive in there. So he takes a bit of honey from the carcass of a dead lion and he eats it and thinks, hmm, when will they invent motorway services? This will be <laughs> quite better. 
cut to the wedding reception. He has a little bet with some of his guests. He says if they can solve this riddle, he'll give them a load of nice clothes, but if they can't solve it, they have to give him a load of clothes. And his riddle was, out of the eater came forth food, and out of the strong came forth sweetness. Which isn't really a riddle, is it? I mean, that is impossible. If this was on a quiz show, no one's buzzing in to say, is it a rotting dead lion with a beehive in its carcass? <laughs> The guests don't want to lose the bet, so they go to his new wife and they say, look, we're going to burn you to death unless you get the answer to your husband's riddle and we'll burn your dad's house down while we're at it, which is pretty rich, seeing as they were guests at her wedding. <laughs> he tells his missus the answer to the riddle and then the guests win the bet, and that really winds Samson up. So to settle the debt, he goes to kill 30 Philistines, which sounds a bit crazy, but don't forget, he is a man who can kill a lion with his bare hands. <laughs> while he's off doing that, his wife's parents decide to give her to one of his mates instead, which means that whilst he was away, uh, his wife's parents have given away his wife to one of the groomsmen. That's weird. He wasn't happy about that, so he did the only thing a spurned man can do. He tied 300 foxes together by their tails, set them on fire and let them loose in the crops of the Philistines. And in retaliation, the Philistines burned Samson's wife, turned her father to death, so Samson killed a thousand Philistines with the jawbone of a donkey. <laughs> Basically, the moral of the story is... <laughs> don't mess with Samson. <laughs> Now, we are going to have a little break so that everyone can go to their kitchens, get out their tins of Lyle's Golden Syrup and see it for themselves. I'll see you in a couple of minutes. <laughs> Welcome back to Modern Life is Goodish. Now, earlier on, I was talking about the codes that govern how animals can be used on food packaging. There are many times when we take in information in code without even knowing that we're doing it. Sometimes they appear to be quite simple, and at other times I think they're quite complex. For example, here is a tap. We all recognise that. We all know what it means if it has got an H on, don't we? That's right, that is somewhere that a small helicopter can land. <laughs> we, all, we all know that. Or, more commonly, H stands for hot, doesn't it? So that tells you that it's a hot water tap. Unless you're in the gent's toilet of any pub, in which case it means, ha, 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 this tap doesn't work, you'll have to use the other one. <laughs> so we all know that that is H for hot. So we all know, of course, what C means. C for cold, of course it is. Unless you're in France. Or, say, one of the many French-speaking parts of the world, like Montreal in Canada. There is a festival in Montreal, I've performed at it a few times, and I have never, ever got used to the sea tap being hot. <laughs> if you're not a linguist, I'll just explain. Uh, in English, obviously, we have hot and cold. In French, however, they have show and... Oh, tell. Show and tell. No, it's not. It's not. <laughs> not show and tell, sorry. Show and Freud, obviously. Show and Freud. I know it's not pronounced Freud, that was just a Freudian slip. Uh, it's... <laughs> it's right. But this isn't just an issue in French-speaking countries. In a lot of the Romance languages, it is C for hot and F for cold. It can get particularly complicated in Spain because there's more than one language there. If you're in the Basque country, it's actually Baroa for hot and Hotza for cold. <laughs> Hotza for cold! <laughs> Clearly, language is a very inefficient system here. If you want to have a foolproof system, you actually have to go with red and blue. They're not as attractive as taps, but they're much more communicative. This is a code that everyone understands. This is universal. As, ladies and gentlemen, is this, ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Internationally recognised symbols for ladies and gentlemen's toilets. <laughs> Sometimes people try to sidestep the gender stereotypes or add a dash of humour to their toilet signs. All they end up doing is adding a beat of thinking time to proceedings. <laughs> and I think we've all experienced times when every second counts. <laughs> I have genuinely seen this on some pub toilets. <laughs> Don't do this! Look, I, I know it's obvious to us which one of these is a cow and which one is a bull, although obviously they could have made it a bit more obvious. <laughs> One of the reasons those symbols are obvious right now is that we're looking at them side by side and because we understand that it's the topic of conversation. We know that they are supposed to denote different toilets. But if you don't have that context and you just find yourself looking at a solitary door with just that on it, <laughs> you haven't even worked out that it is a toilet, let alone started working out which one it's supposed to be. For all you know, it could be the store cupboard for the dairy produce, couldn't it? <laughs> But why make us solve a puzzle when this is so universally understood? I'll give you another example. Salt and pepper pots. 
Just imagine if someone's tuning in right now. What the hell do they think is going on? <laughs> <laughs> when you look at that salt and pepper set, there is ostensibly one difference in the appearance of those two items. They're the same shape, they're the same weight. Everything is the same apart from the number of holes. And because of that, everyone in this room knows which one of those containers contains salt and which one contains pepper, even though there's nothing really telling you which is which. All together now, the pot with one hole contains... Sauce. And the pot with several holes contains... Pepper. Exactly. Everyone knows that. Everyone, that is, apart from my mate Paul, <laughs> who I hope is watching, because that is a picture of his salt and pepper set. I don't even know why I bothered to put them on the screen, because I've got them with me here. <laughs> and these are an abomination, these. I was having dinner at Paul's recently. These were his salt and pepper set. He had four or five friends around. Not one of us could understand how a 48-year-old man could have got this far in life without understanding that salt goes in the pot with one hole. <laughs> but that's what he's done, right? So, just open your palm, sir, right? That's a, that's a pepper pot, isn't it? It's got lots of holes. What's in there? Salt. Salt, yes, <laughs> absolutely. If you're superstitious, don't go over your left shoulder. She's looking scared. <laughs> the more we told him how wrong this is, the more defensive he got. His view is that unless there's a reason why salt must only come out of one hole and pepper could only come out of many, then it ought to just be a free choice. And do you know what? Maybe there is a reason, historically. Maybe it's to do with how expensive salt used to be or about how salt and pepper handle moisture differently. But that doesn't matter, because what's more important than a reason is that there is a system and we all have to stick to it, or there isn't a system. We can't have some maverick seasoner deciding that he's going to do things differently. <laughs> For the same reason, we can't have a maverick driver deciding that green lights mean stop and red lights mean go and amber lights mean close your eyes and count to five and see what happens. <laughs> argue there's got to be a reason for it to be a red light to mean stop. What's important is that everyone knows what it means. <laughs> this was one of those disagreements that just wouldn't end. A couple of days after that dinner, Paul sent all of us an email saying... <laughs> right, firstly, which one of you bastards has stolen my salt and pepper sandwich? <laughs> Sorry, Paul, that was me. That was me. <laughs> and secondly... You're all wrong, as I think this proves. And he sent a link as evidence. <laughs> eat your words, people, eat your words. I'll accept your apologies when I see you next. And you know what? I'd love to eat my words, just not if he's seasoned them. <laughs> if you're trying to prop up your point of view by demonstrating that other people share it, I would recommend not using a decade-old conversation <laughs> on Yahoo Answers as your proof. This is Yahoo Answers, not a place renowned for intelligent discourse. This is a place where people ask, what exactly do dentists do? <laughs> and, Are all tall people stupid? <laughs> and can you get a cat drunk? <laughs> a question that only gets more ridiculous when you realise that they're asking because they've got a cat that needs a haircut. <laughs> Anyway, meanwhile, back at the salt and pepper shaker debate. Salt and pepper shakers, which should have the most holes in the top? My husband and I have an ongoing debate with another couple. How do you have an ongoing debate about something that has a correct answer? <laughs> Plenty of people give this person the right answer, but lots of people gleefully join in with the wrongness too. Look, these couldn't be clearer. They've got the words written on them. One and three, one and three, one and three, one and eight. That is not a coincidence. Now, of course, there is an alternative. If you don't like the one-hole, many-hole system, there are other systems available. You can go colour-coded, can't you? Like this set from the Museum of Modern Art there. Very simple. A bit like the red and blue taps. You can have black and white salt and pepper shakers, can't you? As it says here, each shaker has three holes for dispensing. And yet, we all know which is which still, don't we? Because the shaker's colours identify their contents. Black for pepper, white for salt. Couldn't be simpler. This is a system used by many a salt and pepper shaker manufacturer. There you go. Salt and pepper, salt and pepper, they have got it. So what the hell is going on here? <laughs> One hole, three. <laughs> and a yin and yang in white and black. One hole in the black and three holes in the white. Two competing systems. You're confused all over again. Which is which now? I haven't got a bloody clue. Something that was designed for hippies shouldn't be making me this angry. <laughs> To try and clear up the confusion at Paul's, I have replaced the set I've stolen. I have bought him a new set. I, I, I sent them to him anonymously. Uh, I thought he can't go wrong with those. <laughs> can't go wrong with those. They're marked with an S and a P. About three days after I sent them, he sent another group email. He knew it must be one of us. 
He sent an email saying, I, I just wanted to thank whichever one of you gets has sent me the new <laughs> salt and pepper set. It is indeed foolproof. The next time you come to dinner, you won't be disappointed as I have followed the lettering system to the letter. S for some pepper. <laughs> P for a pinch of salt. <laughs> I'll see you after the break. Life is Goodish. Where at the start of the show, we were discussing the codes that we use to interpret what it means when various animals are used on food packaging. But there is a world where those codes are completely meaningless, where the animal on the packet has got no relevance whatsoever. They're just not playing by the same rules. And that part of the world is the cereal aisle. <laughs> All bets are off. No rules apply. They often have something on the box, whether it's an animal, a person, an anthropomorphic thing of some kind. They're salesmen for the product. What they are, I suppose, is spokes creatures. Uh, <laughs> take this, for example. This is a cereal I'd never encountered before. That's Cookie Crisp from Nestle. And they have a cartoon wolf on the box. And this isn't made of wolves, and it isn't for wolves to eat, but he looks like he wants to tuck into the bowl, doesn't he? He wants to wolf that down. That's what he's there to communicate, the brand values of that cereal. And it's a cartoon wolf, obviously, because it, it wouldn't work with a real wolf, would it? A real wolf just... <laughs> just isn't friendly enough. A real wolf just isn't friendly enough for a breakfast cereal. <laughs> Friendliness, I think, is the key feature required to be a cereal spokes creature. But there is a range of friendliness on offer. Let's examine how friendly these spokes creatures are. If we just bring on the magnetic board. I've got a little experiment to demonstrate these things to you. If I just bring this on here. Thank you very much indeed, guys. Thank you very much. If I bring that on to around there, we should all be able to see it, OK? I've got several uh, serial spokes creatures in here. Let's just start at this end and have a little competition, see which of these is the friendliest. In my right hand, ladies and gentlemen, we have the honey monster. Uh, a monster, a toothless, hairy monster, <laughs> who is addled with addiction. <laughs> oh, yeah, he's fine when he's had his honey, but if he hasn't, he is a wild animal. You know that much. Or you have got Captain Rick from Ricicles, yeah? Flying Space Boy. And now, don't think about which of these you're most familiar with. Think about seeing them for the very first time. You've never encountered these before. Now you're looking at them. Which one do you think is the friendliest? Is it going to be a boy who can fly in space, or is it going to be a hairy monster with addiction issues? <laughs> which, which one of those would you say is the friendliest? The boy, the space boy? OK, we'll put the space boy down there. We'll put him there for now. Let's see how the others stack up, see if these are friendlier or not. Oh, this is a close-fought one, this one. We have two porridge salesmen, ladies and gentlemen. We've got... <laughs> the porridge men. The porridge men. We... I don't know much about the, the Quakers, but I know that's a religious man. And then we've got this one, which is uh, a man doing a Nazi salute... Um, <laughs> ..and preparing to throw a cannonball at you, so... I don't know, I, I really don't know much about the Quakers, but I, I, if I had to sit next to one of them on a bus... ..is it fair to do that? Is that...? I mean, is it, is it going to be the buckle-hatted religious man, or is it going to be the man who lost his shirt in a racist incident? And, um... <laughs> is that...? I, it's that way round. I think... I've put them at this end. I think it's pretty obvious they're not going to be anywhere near the top end of the, of the friendliness scale. And that, that's not sort of cheating, is it? Now, this is... Oh, this is good. This is a, this is a battle royal, this one. We've got, on the one hand, Coco the monkey. Yeah? Skateboarding, baseball cap wearing, cheeky little monkey, Coco. Or he's great. It's the shredded wheat character. <laughs> Look at this. <laughs> shredded wheat character. He really is used to judge up the box. Look at that. He, he really is the face of that cereal, which is weird because he hasn't even bloody got one. But there you go. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm not cheating if I put that. I mean, he's, he's got to be less friendly than a person with a face, hasn't he? He's a, a Brillo pad of wheat. And then the monkey. Well, it's got to be up this end, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah OK, fine, OK. It's all, it's all... I'm just making sure it's all above board. Now, bees. They're quite likeable, aren't they, in one way, but at the same time, they are a creature that will sting you until you or it dies. They are basically the suicide bombers of the insect world, aren't they? The, the bee. I mean, I like the bee. It's a female bee. It's the only female spokes creature I could find in the cereal world. Really, I think, not quite as, as, as friendly as the honey monster, because if his addiction is managed, he's OK. <laughs> As long as he's got his honey, you've got no issue with the honey monster, but the bee will sting you whatever uh, it's had. It's just if it sees you and recognises you are different, you're in trouble. OK, uh, one more left. We've got one more left. 
It's the daddy of them all, ladies and gentlemen. Tony the Tiger, yeah? <laughs> Big Tony, yeah? We're all thinking it, right? In terms of someone you'd want to hang out with, he is properly great. <laughs> And he's been declawed, he's got no teeth, he's been domesticated, basically, and he's also... He also skateboards and occasionally wears things like baseball caps. I mean, he's got to come up this end, hasn't he? That's sort of... It's just whether it's, it's him or... It's Tony or Coco. I've never sounded more like a mafioso, have I, really? <laughs> Is it Tony or Coco? Who's it going to be? Is it Tony or Coco? <laughs> I'll tell, you, I'll tell you what, the, the only way of being fair about this um, is to look at their catchphrases, compare their life, see what message they're sending out to the world. What you got there? They're great! Versus, I'd rather have a bowl of Cocoa Pops. <laughs> I put it to you, ladies and gentlemen, that I'd rather have a bowl of Cocoa Pops is the politics of envy. <laughs> Whereas that is positivity. <laughs> Which of those is the friendliest message, do you think? Is that...? Yeah. Is that a popular, it's a popular choice, OK. Well, that seems to be a nice, reasonable selection, OK? Now, I've done these on this board in front of you with your input rather than doing it on the screen. Because you know it's a PowerPoint presentation. You know every time I press that button, the next thing turns up, it will be a fait accompli. This was not. You got involved. But now I'm going to wheel this in front of the screen, OK? I'm going to show you something on this screen. I had already put those characters in the exact same <laughs> order. But I didn't put them in order of friendliness when I put them on the screen. I was putting them in order of sugar content. <laughs> I made this line based on sugar content and you made this line based on friendliness. And I think this is another rule that we all intuitively know, but we don't know that we know it. When you're in the cereal aisle, you know in your bones that the friendlier the character on the box is, the more sugar there is in the box. Now we know, of course, where Tony Tiger gets all of that energy from. <laughs> and also why he's got no teeth, obviously. <laughs> now, I guess some of you might be thinking, well, why don't they help parents out? Why don't they put the friendlier characters on the healthier cereals? And that might be a help if you're a parent in the cereal aisle of your local supermarket. Of course it might. But you are assuming that these things are aimed at children, and they're not. These cereals are for adults. They must be. How else could you explain the Cereal Killer Cafe in East London, <laughs> which last year was the most talked-about restaurant on Twitter? And never have inverted commas been more required. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that a lot of what was said on Twitter wasn't especially flattering. Because somehow, people who will happily pay £1.50 for a cup of tea get outraged when someone charges them £3.50 for a bowl of cereal. Especially when there is the whiff of hipster about them. <laughs> Personally, it's not really for me, but each to their own. Still, they, they really have generated a lot of newsprint. Firstly, when they launched, then when they inexplicably became hate figures, and they really did, and then when their cafe found itself at the heart of an anti-gentrification riot. But one thing is for sure, whenever they are written about, the people of Britain aren't shy when it comes to offering an opinion <laughs> on those guys and their enterprise. And you know me, ladies and gentlemen. I'm drawn to the bottom half of the internet at times like these. I have read every single comment I could find about that cafe and the men who run it. I've turned my favourite comments into something that I like to call a found poem, which I would like to perform for you now. £3.50 for a large bowl of cereal? Seriously? <laughs> Please note the way I have spelled the word cereal. <laughs> Just look at them. Gits. Beardy gits. I hate beards. I took one look at that headline and thought, I bet this is about selling overpriced cereals with milk. <laughs> and I was right. <laughs> Father Christmas has a beard. <laughs> I bet you don't hate Father Christmas. <laughs> Jesus, too. And Charles Darwin. Even Gary Barlow has a beard these days. <laughs> Whenever I have cereal, I always feel hungry an hour later. I need toast to feel full. Or sausages. <laughs> Personally, I love the idea of this cafe. At the same time, I hate the sound of it. Literally. Because the sound of people eating cereal makes me want to vomit. <laughs> and nobody wants vom on their Cheerios. <laughs> Lol. <laughs> What's next? A toast cafe? Or a cafe that just does sandwiches and drinks? <laughs> 
I eat my cereal before I go to bed. It saves time in the morning. <laughs> it's when I enjoy a fryer. Well, I just hope they're quick to clear away the old bowls. If not, the washing up will be a nightmare. <laughs> like any new business, I wish them every success. But why is the government paying for this? <laughs> the government is not paying for this. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Seriously, they need to let those bowls soak for a while. <laughs> there is nothing tougher than dried on cereal. You should have written seriously <laughs> instead of seriously. I did it earlier. <laughs> Scroll back and read it. Let me know what you think. Seriously. I thank you. <laughs> I was just taking a Polaroid selfie with Anton down here. Uh, anyway, welcome back uh, to Modern Life is Goodish. Uh, I'm just going to put this somewhere to, to develop. I'm just going to put that down there to develop. Now, we have been talking, ladies and gentlemen, about the codes and the symbols that we see in life. Codes that we know, but we don't know that we know. And they are everywhere. But there are new codes being developed. And I think the online world has brought some people into contact with codes they don't understand yet, because they're new to that world. I don't know if you're familiar with the phrase, but if you're reading news online, say, at the bottom of the page, you'll probably see some ads and things that look like that. These are examples of clickbait. That there is an example of celebrity clickbait. They're using a picture of Matthew Perry from Friends and the words, from riches to rags, ten celebrities who are broke. Now, if you click on that link, you will be taken to a list of celebs that they claim are broke, but it could be that the list contains ten celebs and one of them will be Matthew Perry. Or it could be that the list contains not ten celebs and none of them will be Matthew Perry. <laughs> what do you expect to be behind that link? Hands up if you think it will be the first. Smattering of you. And hands up if you think it will be the second. The vast majority of you. And you're right. If you click on that link, the article you'll be taken to is actually called 25 Celebrities <laughs> Who Are Broke. And when you click through all 25 of them, you will see that none of them are Matthew Perry from Friends. And the fact that most of you knew that is proof that you understand the code of clickbait. And the code of clickbait is that the words and pictures that act as the bait tend to bear no relation whatsoever to the thing you're going to click through to. They try to tempt you to read their wares by pretending that Matthew Perry is in there, and then he's not in there. It's like if some bloke off the telly tried to get you to watch his show by promising there was some story about sitting next to Jennifer Aniston on a roller coaster, even though it, <laughs> it never happened. Right? It didn't happen. It wasn't a roller coaster. It was a plane. And it wasn't Jennifer Aniston. I don't even know who he was. <laughs> it didn't happen. I don't know why they do this, but I have a theory that they do it on purpose. Think about why these things exist. They want you to click through from page to page because every single page contains advertising. And weirdly, I think there's something about the lie that makes that more likely to happen. It's what's known as the turd effect. Or at least that's what I call it, the turd <laughs> effect. At some point, once you've clicked on some clickbait, there will be a realisation that you've made a mistake, that you've wandered into a dishonest corner of the internet. You knew when it said there were 25 broke stars in their list rather than the 10 that advertised that something was up. You're 12 clicks in, and now you know in your gut that the Matthew Perry content you came looking for isn't going to be there. So common sense says that you should just cut your losses and leave. But you don't. You need to prove to yourself that you're being lied to. And so you waste more time proving that your time has been wasted. Basically, clicking on clickbait is like treading in a turd. And continuing to click is like smelling your shoe to prove it happened. <laughs> of course, clickbait is a relatively new phenomenon, so there are people out there who don't really understand these codes. I have an elderly neighbour, right? He's a, he's a lovely chap, he's called Ken. He doesn't even have a computer. He's never been online. 
Myself and Ken chat quite a lot. I pop round, I do odd jobs here and there for him and do a bit of shopping. He asks a lot of questions about what I'm up to. He's very attentive. Foolishly, last time I was there, I said I was thinking about doing something about clickbait. And he immediately said, well, what's that then? And it is almost impossible to explain it to someone who has never used the internet. So I had to come up with an analogy. I said, look, imagine the internet is a pub, OK? And you're in the pub one night, you're having a nice time. And as you walk down the corridor to the loo, you pass a door to a function room. And there's a sign on the door that says it's the George Clooney Lounge. So what would you think is behind that door, Ken? And Ken said, is it an espresso machine? <laughs> Well, OK, no, that's a good example, Ken. That's, that's a good idea. It could be. It could be. That's a good idea. You can see that the George Clooney lounge should have some connection to George Clooney, couldn't it? It could just be an espresso machine, or it could be uh, an Ocean's Eleven-styled room, or it could just be a room that George Clooney once visited, or it, it could be some kind of shrine to George Clooney. Imagine, instead, walking through the door and finding there's not one picture of him, but there are loads of pictures of other celebrities. That is rubbing pepper in your wounds, as my mate Paul would put it. Now, <laughs> underneath each picture of not George Clooney, Ken, imagine there's a little poster advertising some tawdry product that you're not interested in. You're feeling conned now. You know that the name the George Clooney Lounge was dishonest, but maybe you would still check out all the pictures on the walls just to make sure. That, Ken, I said, is how clickbait works. And I was quite proud of that as an explanation. I think Ken got the idea. Although, he didn't think that people would hang around. Why would you stay and look at all the other pictures? People wouldn't do that, he was saying. I was like, I don't know, I think they might. And he was like, well, I guess we'll never really know. And I thought, well, you say that, Ken. You say that. <laughs> I thought I would bring the analogy to life to see if people would click through to the end of the clickbait. I hired a room in a local pub. I called it the George Clooney Lounge for one night and one night only. That is a sign on the door of a room that you pass on the way to the toilet in this pub. Inside, I hung a load of pictures of people who aren't George Clooney. I didn't want to go and buy any pictures. I just used some pictures that I had hanging around the place at home, uh, which means they were actually all pictures of the same celebrity, uh, which is, of course, Alan Sugar. Um, <laughs> just got them off the dining room wall and threw them in the, in the pub for the night. Uh, some of them very obviously Alan Sugar. You'd know they were him from three or four yards away. Some of them were less obvious. Uh, at the size these were framed, you'd have to get up quite close to know for sure that it was him you were looking at. You wouldn't confirm for yourself that it wasn't George Clooney, only if you hung around. And to really make the analogy with clickbait as strong as I could, underneath each picture, I stuck up a little advert for the sort of things you might see online. Yellowing teeth, liposuction, balding hair replacement treatments, that kind of stuff. So you walk through the door that says the George Clooney lounge, and you see a load of Alan Sugars all over the wall. You instantly know that something's not right. But how do I know if someone stays to the end and looks at every picture? Well, to simulate that part of the experience, I put an easel in the corner of the room with a velvet curtain covering a final picture. And you only get to see that picture if you go and pull a rope. That, to my mind, is the final click. And if you pull the rope, well, what you see is another picture <laughs> of Alan Sugar. <laughs> the footage here isn't exciting. Don't get all excited about what's going to come up. It isn't the hidden camera show. Nobody's wearing a microphone, so the sound is bad. And what's happening to people is they're experiencing a clooney-less disappointment. It is basically disappointing footage of people being disappointed. <laughs> Which is what I knew it would be. I wasn't doing the filming so that I could show you it. I was doing the filming so that I would know how many people did what. So I'll tell you the numbers. 76 people walked down that corridor to and from the toilets during the time we were in that pub. Of those people, 42 of them walked straight on by, didn't enter the room, didn't fall for the bait, which doesn't trouble me in the slightest. Think about how many millions of people don't click on the clickbait links that they see every day of their lives. That is to be expected. But that means, of course, that 34 people did enter the room. So how many of those do you think went through the entire experience? Incidentally, I, sh I should share this with you. We had all these hours of footage, which I genuinely had no intention of showing you, and then somebody, one of the producers, gave it to somebody else and said, just cut that into clips, can you? And he cut it all into clips. And because people aren't wearing microphones, that means he subtitled everything. <laughs> Some guy, genuinely, he spent three days subtitling four hours of people walking into a room and then walking out being disappointed. <laughs> This will show you quite how zealous they were when it came to subtitling. <laughs> <laughs> the bit of a miscommunication. Somebody wasted three days of their life doing that. I think we can agree the footage is gone. It's the numbers that are of interest. So let me tell you, 34 people came in. 34 people fell for the bait. 
Of those 34 people, a massive 30 of them pulled the cord. That is 88% of people who took all of the bait and got to the end of the experiment. And look, seeing as that poor guy spent all those hours putting all those clips together, here, just so, so he justifies the work he put in, is a little montage of people pulling the cord. <laughs> he's the only guy, he's the only guy who spotted the camera there. The only one. I think, I think in a weird way, this has proved my theory. I think this has proved my theory for myself and to my neighbour Ken that this does actually work. The turd effect is real. I was quite sort of satisfied with that. What I wasn't expecting was for me to be reviewing the footage and discovering that our experiment reveals other behaviours. There is this chap here, right? He came in, he was straight into the middle of the room, took one look around, and then he left immediately in a kind of, oh, this is nonsense, I'm not interested, there's something up here. He just left, right? Two or three minutes later, this happened. <laughs> it's him. <laughs> he came back with some friends. <laughs> Basically, we have found one of those people who lands on a page like that and then clicks on one of those buttons. <laughs> He's out there. Didn't think that was going to be possible. There is another kind of behaviour that I genuinely didn't think we could possibly uncover with this experiment. Uh, of the four people who didn't pull the cord, who didn't click the final link, two of them didn't click the link because they clicked on an advert instead which doesn't sound like it's possible given the parameters of this experiment, but I promise you, it is what happened, OK? This is the picture they'd got as far as. That's the, the picture of Alan and his cycling gear, OK? And the advert that was underneath it was that one about liposuction. I'm just going to leave that there because I think it's more important that we see what they were responding to than that we see them responding to it. We will see their feet moving and we will hear their words, and thanks to an extraordinarily dedicated producer, we will also read what they said. Here they go. I would like to lose the bulge. And then it's Isn't that sad? I feel genuinely awful about that. Two girls, Anna and a night out, in the pub, seeing an advert for something as tawdry as liposuction that we put up for a silly experiment to see if it would work, and that sort of cast a cloud over their night out. That makes me feel kind of guilty. But then I suppose seeing those adverts online would have a similar effect, wouldn't it? That's the effect of those kind of adverts. That's the, the way our worlds are assaulted these days. I suppose, in a way, that just proves my point. In a way, I think that proves that my live-action clickbait experiment was uncannily accurate. And I think it says something about how we respond to signals. Because that's what tonight's show has been about, ladies and gentlemen, the, the codes and signals that we respond to and about how many of the messages we send and receive are done subconsciously. Some things mean exactly what they say, while other things mean something else entirely. And we are emotionally intelligent beasts who train ourselves to know the difference between them. Some of them are verbal, of course, but it, it's not necessarily as simple as just hearing the words that are being said, is it? Sometimes you need to also take in the visual clues, and sometimes those visual clues are just misleading, aren't they? They're making you think something's going to happen when <laughs> nothing of the sort <laughs> was ever, ever going to happen. Which is really the lesson of tonight's show. But before we go, I've just remembered, I took a little selfie with Anton early, didn't I? I took a little selfie with Anton. It should have developed by now. Let's have a look. Oh, look at that, Anton. Do you want to have a little look at that? Look at that. That's nice, isn't it? You and me, Anton. I'll just, uh, just get the, uh, the show shredder out and uh, shred that. There you go. Ken, if you're watching, that's Snapchat. <laughs> <laughs>